Well, it's another beautiful day and you're welcome to Captured by Women. My name is Nancy Vukanya and I'm a management consultant. I'm here in studio at Emerald Properties and Cantonments with my co-hosts here. Matilda Abahins, a communications expert. Elizabeth Olympio Emmanuel, a restaurateur and a project management consultant. Let's take a recap of last week's show. Me, um, drawing lessons from the mining sector, Galam C, um, I am always of the view that punishment should always be the last resort. You realize that people would want to do it because they see it as a source of livelihood. So how then do you formalize it, open it up, so that people can come from the right permitting, they can come from the right licenses, so that you'd have the opportunity to even gather data on, on the number of people who are interested in this trade, so that you can have customized programs for them, and then identify them and then educate them. So for me, I am of the view that punishment should be the last resort. Of course, if uh, people go to the extreme, you need to punish to serve as a deterrent, but, but, but we need to formalize the sector. But don't we need to punish? <laughs> This show is sponsored by Emerald Seats in Cantonments. It is also sponsored by Woodin Le Createur. Coming up in this segment, we will be looking at the outbursts, the rant of Senor Hossi, CEO of the Bulk Oil Distributors, on the seeming lack of quality coming out from the university. Stay with us. It's been a very stormy week for the Chief Executive Officer of the Public Procurement Authority. First, he was cited in a conflict of interest case on the contracts for sale documentary by, by Manasi Azuri. Then, he was suspended by the President and invited by the Special Prosecutor to appear before him on the 29th of August. And so, this is what you will be served this week on Captured by Women. Coming up on the spin today, the police administration has been struck with a lot of tragic deaths of our gallant policemen, both in the Eastern region and Ashanti region. We will be looking at this on the spin up next on Captured by Women. You're welcome back from the break. This is still Captured by Women. Ladies. Policemen are being killed, and it's such a worrying situation that has developed lately. And uh, some people say that, you know, robbers or armed robbers or people who infringe on the laws do these things to put some, you know, scare into the police force so they leave them alone to operate. Yeah. I don't know how the policemen patrol, but I don't see why policemen should be alone. They're normally in, um, in squads, in pairs. So if this is not happening, then it's something that is missing um, from the police administration side. I don't know, because um, some people, uh, some policemen have said frankly, off camera, of course, that one, it's very difficult, you know, for them to, for the administration to transfer certain people that are maybe favored within the force to certain areas. So there are many areas that lack the requisite number of policemen. So then that shortage causes, you know, the fact that some policemen have to go out by themselves to do the job. And then also, they talk about the lack of the resources. Yeah. Some of the guns don't even fire, apparently. No, they need resources. It, 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 it sounds sad. It's it a is. sad situation for me to think that you'd have policemen targeted by criminals, mm -hmm. so to say. Um, one it puts fear in the police service itself or amongst the personnel. Two, it also kind of puts fear in the public because we are relying on the police service to give us protection, security mm. for the state, yes. internal security um, for us as a people. So for, for us to be having these kind of occurrences, then it means that the police service needs to sit back now and start strategizing because they need to let us as a people regain confidence in them as a, as a personnel, as a service. Atili, how, how does that work if the police are so badly resourced? I mean, 
if they tell you the kinds of situations that they're in, some of them wield guns that don't work. Some of them don't even have the guns at all. Some of them are transferred to very remote places where they're not even mobile, yet they're supposed to maintain law and order. I think sometimes we're a bit harsh on the police. But then again, recently, there's been some uh, resource injection into the police service. Mm. We've had new vehicles coming in. Mm. So we probably have to look at, suggest a priority list where the persons themselves, the police force, which is the recruits, mm -hmm. are able to defend themselves with the appropriate resources instead of the city cars. Well, some people are saying that, um, okay, some, some schools of thought have the opinion that they're not also properly trained. I cannot say that for I, sure. I, 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 I think, think our training, training school is, is up to really right. standard. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they do. Uh, they do it's, go through rigorous training. Just, it's not a training issue. If the person is not resourced well, he cannot be he effective. Can't make use and of the if training. we outnumber them, because there's a ratio, there is, and we haven't been able to meet the ratio. We've been struggling to meet that ratio, mm. and and that means that we have exposed them mm. to yeah. the public that is criminal. Yes. Uh -huh. And so we have to now start looking at ensuring that we have enough police men. Remember, this year itself is um, halfway through. We are in the last quarter or approaching the last quarter. And then we go into election year. And so we need a lot more uh, police personnel to do their job. So the logistics available, are they enough? Um, what kind of training are we giving them? The last time we looked at um, the body camera. Mm that we are going to introduce. Because, for instance, the last one, which happened on um, Tuesday, the mm. past Tuesday, you had um, a police officer who was seen sitting down and killed. Yeah. How was he killed? What were the reasons? If we don't have enough personnel we should, for the police, we should start working with the intelligence um, units who are in all the communities. I think, I think the intelligence people are uh, get more, much more training in terms of the collaborations with you know foreign security agencies the CID side of the police get a lot of training but I'm, I'm not sure about you know the rest of the force but I have, I have this really um, heavy experience that I think I should share with you ladies where I was traveling between if you've been on the Kumasi Akra mm -hmm. road between uh, Bonsu and, and Kofridwa yes. through Pokrantumi mm -hmm. to Kofridwa yeah. and there was a, it was it was a passenger vehicle and there was a spot on the road that the the, the, the driver kept saying, if we go past this bit, if we go past that curve, we'll be fine. So I kept wondering. So after we went past it, I saw a, a kiosk, you know, sort of a blue kiosk. So after we went past it, I asked him, why did you keep, you know, saying that would be fine? And he said, well, there's a, that kiosk you saw is a den of robbers and the police are unable to stop them. I hope the police are listening to us today. Oh, wow. So, so the police are just unable to just because they just don't have the resources. But then again, and these criminals have guns. You see, this last one, the, the pair that were killed, mm. the corporal and the lance corporal, they yeah. were actually together. The armed robbers killed the other one. And then the, the, his colleague, Alassan, was also found with a rifle between his legs. And, and there was a police lady in a pool uh, of who blood. was shot dead also up north yes. in Kumbungu. Yes, yeah. that was also reported during the news cycles. It's, it's quite a shame. Ooh. But I mean, I would hope that. I don't know if, for, from my civilian mind, I don't know if this is sort of going to expose our security you know, service to some sort of dangers. But I would think that the police service, you know, in the meantime, would collaborate with the other some agencies. other security agents or foreign, for some sort of support, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking computers because the last time the police were giving computers by Chinese people, <laughs> people said, well, what if they've embedded some, you know, softwares and things. But I'm just, you know, hoping that because of this lack of resources, we're going through all of this. So yes, but you know, it, I, I think is communities... Is it possible for them to do that? Yes. And then communities should also begin to look out for people amongst us. Watchdog who, yes. communities. Yeah. Either a watchdog or... Or people should just individually be more alert. You think the person is... Um, suspicious in right. the when kind of activities he or moves she into the in, mm -hmm. yeah. we should come out and then report to the needed uh, or the authorized uh, uh, people mm. because you know 
th there's also been that fear that you go, you report, and your name is mentioned. <laughs> uh -huh. right. So right. once we report, we have to yes. appeal to the police mm. that once we report the suspicious characters amongst us, they should also be very, very protective of informants the so informants that at the end protected. of the uh, whole exercise, the person who was the informant would be will feel uh, safe as safe well enough know? to bring you another information yeah, yeah. Mm. okay <laughs> um i don't know uh this is this has been a very worrying situation and uh, we hope that you know we all learn to be more security mm. conscious we, because remember people. if uh, nancy you you find me suspicious or uh, <laughs> you, you, you find <laughs> eliza suspicious and you don't say it tomorrow you might be the victim, <laughs> the victim. Mm. everybody 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 anybody could be a victim to this yeah. sort of um, attack or thing. Our condolences go out to you know to the, the families, families yeah. of all the, the the servicemen that we've lost you know over the past few weeks to the spate of armed robbery in this country. I think that we should all become more security conscious. You know, we should report suspected behavior, suspected characters. You know, to make the work of the police a little bit more easier. You know, to 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 protect all of us and maintain law and order. This has been the spin on captured by women. Join us after the break. The Chief Executive Officer of the Public Procurement Authority, Dr. Ejenim Boating Ej, has been cited in a conflict of interest case in a documentary by Manasi Azuri, which is the contracts for sale. And Nancy was able to get in touch with some experts and had some perspectives from them. Nancy, what were the things that you picked up? Well, um, frankly, um, he was cited um, uh, on record, you know, making some admissions about owning some shares in a company that has won about 14 uh, contracts, you know, uh, from the Public Procurement Authority. Um, he, he was also um, heard on record saying that he owned 50% shares with his brother-in-law or cousin or cousin <laughs> you know so so those are facts and those were said on record so we know those for sure we tried to find out you know if um, he was within his rights to set up a company and um, because being a public figure you know some people were of the view that because everything is provided is, was it part of the law? Was it unlawful for him to have been part of a company like that? He was well within his rights, so you know there's no infringement. In okay, that but area. you know that there's been very rapid developments during the day mm. for this particular um, recording because you have him being suspended by the president, the public prosecutor or the state prosecutor has also invited him for to appear before him on the 29th right. of August. Yes. And so do you see this as um, a way by government to try to um, make sure that he's brought to book quickly? Well, I mean, lately government has come under a lot of um, scrutiny for making these cases go away or for not doing much. So I think that this move is in that sort of direction to make it look like a very quick response mm. to something, you know, this big. Because for, for a lot of people, public procurement authority is equal to, if you're looking at it mathematic, mathematically, value for money, more or less. These are the people that are supposed to make sure that we have value for money. But Eliza, in this we've country. had some concerns from the public that said that a lot of people had been cited previously for different things in different cases, mm. and yet um, in the public eye they were culpable, but they had been cleared, citing a clearinghouse kind of thing. Should we relax just before we go mm. to your your discussion? Yeah, but I think what happens most of the time is part of our Ghanaian cultural setup where we forgive the fama nyame, we keep quiet, we are excited when it happens, um, uh, there's a lot of furore around it, then the news dies quietly, we don't ask questions. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I think the position he held, being CEO of PPA, mm -hmm. so critical, and that's a clear conflict of interest and theft. Well, Nancy had an interview with some experts on the contracts for sale, the implications 
of the events that have happened, as well as the appearance before the special prosecutor on the 29th of August. So viewers, you're still watching Captured by Women, and we have with us Mr. Collings Ajimang Sapon, who is the president of the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply. You're welcome to the show, sir, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Well, there's a story that is big and has been in the news cycle. Manasseh Azuri, an independent investigative journalist, you know, has released a video and um, it's, it's indicting the boss of Ghana's uh, procurement agency, ABJ, you know, for being involved in uh, one or two more feasances uh, that may require some investigation. You have seen the video, I suppose. What do you make of it? Well, I have seen the video. Um, watching it, it was quite revealing. And uh, from where we sit, uh, what we can say is marked of what we can call conflict of interest. However, um, we need to, now the president had given it to the investigative bodies, that's the OSP and the SHRAD, and um, my institute too, we, have, we issued a statement regarding that, and we have also referred it to our Ethics and Professional Standard Committee, where they are going to look into it to really establish whether really there was um, a conflict of interest. Because from where we sit as a professional body, you cannot just make conclusive statement or conclusive, um, um, you cannot conclude that he's at fault just because of the video. So <clears throat> the Institute will officially request for the video because we need to show, uh, we need to keep files of everything. Then we will invite our member because he's our member, he's a, a senior member of our institute. So they will look into the issue, then they will come up with their conclusion, whether really there, 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 there was or there is a conflict of interest. Then we will, uh, Take it from there, yeah. Well, um, this just brings me to my next um, uh, question of inquiry. Um, was he well within his rights to have a private company established right after he becomes boss of procurement in this country, representing value for money for this country, more or less? You know, that's how most people would see it. Do you think um, he was well within his rights? Or let's say, what does the law say on this? I know that your ethics committee may have its own bylaws to work with, but statutory law, what does, what's the position of the law in this sort of instance? Well, I think from, from the law, um, either the Company Act or association or whatever, he being an individual forming a company, the act of forming a company, you can't say that um, he's wrong. Okay. He's not wrong. He can form a company. He can be a director of any company he so wishes. Okay. However, when it comes to conflict of interest, like uh, in our code of ethics, that's a code of ethics, Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply, we have a code of ethics. And when you look at um, Article 13, of our code of actors talks of manage conflict of interest. As a person, when you are working for a particular organization, you owe it a duty to exercise uh, a care in a dent. Uh, if you if you allow me, I'll read because he's our member. So so said, be responsible and act in a fiduciary capacity and exercise duty of care in identifying, assessing, and managing possible conflicts of interest, whether actual or issues which could be viewed, whether actual or issues which could be viewed as conflicts that may arise in my daily working life, rejecting any business practices which might reasonably be deemed improper. And now under it, it says that never use 
my authority or position for financial gain, declaring to my employer any personal interest that might affect or be seen by others to have effect in decision making, ensuring that the information given in the course of my work is accurate and not misleading, striving for genuine, fair, and transparent competition, and being truthful about my skills, experience, and qualification. So in our co code of actors, this is under uh, section 13 or uh, article 13 that states that any time any of these things is breached, it can be deemed as you breaching our conflict of interest. So this is what is the, I don't know. So that is why we cannot just look at the video or watch the video and just conclude. So now we will go officially get the video, call our member and come to the committee. Then the committee will hear from him, will do further background or further investigation. Then we can conclude that, hey, there is a conflict of interest here and there. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Sapon would also want to know, okay, a lot of, uh, or let's say many CSOs, which are civil society organizations, are calling for, you know, a complete dissolution of the board, you know, of, of, of the agency, and um, because they think that, you know, he couldn't have been the only one involved in any malfeasance, if any malfeasance is, you know, said to have happened after the investigations. What's your take on that? Well, yesterday in our statement, we, we did not um, direct our issue to the board because the investigation or the video we all watched we didn't see much of the board being an issue in it. However, like people are extending the argument that, hey, the man serves on the board and he is the CEO, so what was the board doing? We need to also wait for the investigation to end. However, from our side, for a procurement to end, it's not only the supplier or the, the, the purchaser or the contractor. The one who is even also awarding the contract, where this supposed business, this supposed company, where were they getting the contract from? The procurement staff, the other people in those organizations, what, what did they see to award this contract? So in our statement, we call for an extension because we think that if the procurement entities in procurement procurement entity is the organization so like uh, TV3 your organization is a procurement entity so we think that the investigation should also not be only our member but also the procurement entities what happened if truly conflict of interest had happened. What happened? What did they see? What pre-qualification? So we will call for that. For now, yes, the CSOs is within their right to also call for dissolution of the board, blah, blah, blah. But as an institute, it is the member that we are focusing on now. So we will not say that the call for the board dissolution is right or wrong. Let us also see the investigation that comes out. Then we can make a conclusive statement on it. All right. So as you uh, prepare to deal with your member, as you put it, have you formally requested for the video? In fact, it was yesterday that the council members, the executives, and the committee on uh, ethics and uh, uh, professional standards we met and we issued the statement. And one of the uh, uh, takeaways is for them to, the committee, to request officially for the video from Manasseh so that they can also watch. Because for all you know, we, we may even want, if we can get the unedited or whatever, so we will, the committee will officially uh, request for the video and they will take it from there. 
All right. Um, just before we leave you, uh, I would want to know if um, I'm not asking you to pass judgment here. I'm not putting you on the spot here. But <laughs> any expected outcomes from Shraj, from, from the special prosecutor? I mean, we're all looking forward to knowing what will happen on the 29th. But just, you know, any expected outcomes at all? <laughs> well, I, they, they are institutions um, uh, paid by our taxpayers. So if the president of the nation personally or by direction had given a work to you, we should hope that they will do their work and really come out with the report. Yeah. All right, we'd want to say thank you, but I think I'm going to ask you a last question because openly on the video, he has admitted owning shares in a company that is implicated in this issue. Do you not think that's enough uh, proof to, let's say, be a little bit judgmental before, you know, the results of the inquiry comes out? <laughs> well, it's a video. Okay. And uh, we are in the technological world. Voices can be muffled. Pictures can be, whatever. that is why we really want to have the video, when was this video taken, where, with all the evidences from, from the, 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 the journalist. Once all is confirmed, okay, it, for all you know, you will see his picture, but he wasn't the person even speaking. He, maybe voiceover was, was, was called on the picture. Maybe you will get him. He was, maybe for all you know, he was saying something totally different. But the voice will be placed on that. We called for the president to also help the institute to pass a practicing law or a practicing act that will regulate the behaviors of procurement and supply practitioners. For example, now we have a law that regulates how procurement should be done. That's the Procurement Act, 63, as amended. But the people doing the procurement, the behaviors, the ethics and all, is not, is not present. So we are, and almost all the professional bodies in Ghana do have a practicing law back in them. You can't just come to Ghana and say, because you've studied medicine, you are a doctor. You need to be part of the Ghana Medical Association. Same as lawyers. They have a law backing them, the engineers and all. So um, we are calling because we think that 70% of almost every organization, their costs, is controlled by procurement. And therefore, if there's no uh, act regulating the people that lead and manage this function, we may have various issues mimicking what we are hearing. So we, 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 we call on the government, I mean the president itself, to help us pass our practicing act so that we can regulate some of these behaviors. Well, great point there, uh, Mr. Collins Ajiman Sapon. Um, the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply is clearly calling uh, for a look at, you know, a sort of act that will um, support the work of procurement in this country or will regulate, you know, how people involved in procurement behave when it comes to their work. We're grateful for joining us here on Captured by Women. Thank you. Well, viewers, this has been Mr. Collings Ajimang Sapon. He's a president of the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply, and he's been speaking to us here on Captured by Women. Do stay tuned, and we will be back after the break. Welcome back from the break. My name is Elizabeth. Sometime the past few days, there was a homecoming event at the University of Ghana marking as part of celebrations of the 70th anniversary of the university. The ambassador, anniversary ambassador, Mr. Senor Hosi, who is the CEO of the bulk oil distributors and an alumnus of the university, 
had a few words to say about the quality of graduates coming out of the university. Joining us today is Mr. Chris Atadika, President of the Legon Chapter of the Graduate Students Association of Ghana. Chris, you're welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you. What is your take on this rant by Mr. Senor Hosi? Um, first of all, it's very unfortunate that he used um, the platform of our beloved university to pass such defamatory and degrading comments about the university. It's, it's very unfortunate. Um, going straight to the subject matter that he talked about, he talked about um, TAs doing the thesis for graduate students, which I, I, I think and I believe strongly is false. Um, some, something of that sort does not happen at the University of Ghana. Um, we have systems and structures in place that make sure that students do these theses on their own. So for example, when you come to the MBA program, we have weekly seminars where each student will come and present in, in front of the students and, and lecturers. And you are to give reports on how the thesis is, is, is going. So I don't think that with a TA doing a thesis for you, you would be able to present like that. And if you don't present, we have marks awarded for seminars. You have also at the School of Graduate Studies, there's an academic board in charge of um, scrutinizing, you know, and checking for academic more practices like plagiarism when it comes to the thesis. So for him to make a blanket statement without facts that graduate students have um, TAs doing their, their thesis for them. It's so wrong. I mean, we, we even have rules and regulations in the statutes of the university against some of these, these practices. So he, he, it's, it's not factual. Yeah. And, 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 and maybe he spoke out of emotion. So people think it's the bitter truth. Is this to say that the outburst is unfounded and that at no stage, not at the graduate level, what about the undergrad, undergrad level? Would you be finding situations where students are not really working for their grades? At the, at the undergrad level, it's even worse because you'd, you'd have a regular system of schooling where the lecturers are, are checking up on you. You have weekly presentations, group discussions, and, and you, you, can't, you can't go through the system that the school has with, with a TA doing your thesis for you. Okay, it's, so it's is it possible that he's also coming, coming from a corporate world and looking at the job market and uh, hiring graduates, he finds there's a, a setback. There is something missing from the quality of graduates coming out from any university per se. This is not to say Legon uh, in this instance. Is there something that is lacking in the quality of graduates coming onto the job market? Okay, so I, I have a bit of work experience. So um, I, know, I know when it comes to fresh graduates coming into the workplace, adjusting to the workplace and everything, all these things don't happen in the university. We, we need corporate institutions and firms giving students the opportunity to intern. Now you realize that during the whole program, that's the degree program or even postgraduate program, most of these students apply for internship in these firms and are not even given the opportunity to, 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 do, um, so. to do so. Shouldn't it be the university paving the path for this internship to be uh, more acceptable to the corporate world so they can do two weeks, a Excellent. month or two? Brilliant. That's why we have a career and counseling center in the university, which helps in placing students during their vacations for internship programs. They, they, they do a lot. They, okay. they, they send a lot of um, internship opportunities through our student email addresses. We even come to, um, um, even Grasak as an, as an association, we go out there to these corporate firms to try and get internship slots for our students. But so, Chris, is he not tapping perhaps into um, the concerns by industry players that there's been um, a kind of shortage in terms of the way the curricula goes on and so you you find graduates coming up and they are not prepared sort of like a disconnect yes a disconnect you know, and the calls the for a, a real look at, uh, at the curricula the content you know maybe. you know there's there's a lot the university has done over the years um, 
you, you realize that when you come to a, a typical undergrad program in the business school, um, your first year, your, that's your first semester, you would have to select either two of these languages, French or Chinese. Mm. Now, these languages, it, it means that the university is trying to prepare you for the international stage and, and, and make you more employable at the, at the international level. Mm. Now, you look at mandatory courses like UG, UGRC, critical thinking. Students are, are, undertake this, this course, which is mandatory, and it gives them critical and analytical thinking skills. Now, so, and, and even there are um, um, exchange programs outside Ghana and what have you. So the university is doing its best. Um, you even look at, just quite recently, we now have Wi-Fi systems all over the university. All these, thing, all these things are done to improve teaching and learning. And we believe that it's not just the, the, the responsibility of the university. Industry must also support the university in making sure that these students have practical knowledge when it comes to whatever they are studying. But what is the ongoing work on attitude, especially when you come into the corporate world? Because it's been one of the concerns of industry that the attitude of the students when they come, a lot of them have been issues. You see, um, for example, I've had several times personally where I've been sacked from a classroom because I, I maybe appeared five minutes or 10 minutes mm -hmm. late uh, bef before the, um, um, after the lecturer started mm -hmm. um, lecturing. Some of these things I incorporated into the students. Integrity, during our exams, we, we have cameras all over to make sure that students do not copy during exams. I can tell you and say on authority and fact that most University of Ghana students write exams without copying. Hmm. And, 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 and this is true and this is a fact because we have a strong system that, that disciplines students when they engage in examination or practices. But does this apply to when you get onto the field and you have struggled to get internship or jobs and then your employer realizes that you might have done so well at the interview session but your attitude is just not good enough for you to be kept in the environment i, I think with the attitude it's it's relative i mean what about work ethics so we are taught work ethics okay you realize that even during during um, um the program there are presentations there are seminars you get people to come in um, talk to us, we interact. We are even taught how to network. In, at the business school, for example, there's a whole week that is dedicated to networking, where we get industry people coming to the business school to interact and speak to our students. We even have um, job fairs, career fairs, and, and what have you. All these things are geared towards getting students to have the right work ethics when they start work. I can see you're very passionate about your university. And I think we all are passionate about our schools that we went to and so on and so forth. Um, by, by the way, which school did you go to? K and UST. Oh. <laughs> Your rival, by the way. <laughs> so um, you speak very passionately and it's admirable. You remind me of, I mean, we've all watched the video of Senor going on and, you know, ranting and all of that. And you remind me of that. You know, all of this passion is all fair and good. You cannot tell me that Mr. Senor Jose doesn't love his university. He probably does. He was there as an ambassador, you know, he said a lot of things. But I feel as if clearly there's a disconnect. You can't tell me that the University of Ghana is just putting people through school for purely academic work. You know, there are some people that do practical learning, you know, especially maybe the doctors and, and so on, that they come out and they're professionals. So you cannot tell me that, I mean, many people have said Professor Yao Jampo has reacted to this, you know, you've all seen that on Facebook and everywhere. And um, he said that, you know, sometimes you have to do the classics because people have complained that the, some of the lesson notes are from the 19, you know, I mean, this is an exaggeration, yeah. but you can, from 25 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe. And then he says, well, we do research, we upgrade, but um, I think that in, in the old days, it was, graduates were more employable, you know, as far as I know. Why is it different now? Doesn't he have a point? At least the slightest point. Because there is, is public making, opinion. Yes, there is. And it matters. Don't you think so? You yourself. You see, um, 
All I, all I want to say is, hmm. it's not the entire fault of the university because we, we need okay. corporate world to also assist in this whole process. You, you, you cannot just say that the university is, is, is churning out people who, are, who don't have substance. So yes, I agreed that the platform he used was wrong. Being an ad anniversary ambassador was wrong, right. but there is some and, and also to some say information we, there we are that not thinking in the university. He, he was, I think, was I think he harsh. was so in with, with, <laughs> uh, with, 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 with his... Um, I don't want to use <laughs> okay. outburst. Outburst. <laughs> <laughs> but but with whatever he said, is there an iota of truth? That's all people That's, are asking. Because yes. Is there an iota of truth in it? Mm. Have you at any point had concerns as the Grasak president from any member of the public to think about? You see, he he what he should have done was constructive criticism. Where after criticizing he, he should have said that, oh, okay, suggestions. yes, suggestions, or, or be a part of the solution. That is what we want to see now mm. in people who we call as mentors. Now, for example, in just the just ended uh, July congregation, we had um, lawyer Kunyenya mm. um, Kimathi coming to, to speak to us. He was a guest speaker. Right. Now, after identifying some problems in the, in the law school, okay, what he did was he, he created a fund where he, I think about, um, is it $10,000 or oh. so to a library, a library fund oh. okay, for the university. So if Mr. Hosi says that he has seen that, oh, the, the students coming out from the university don't have practical knowledge, and at the end of the day says that, okay, now my company is going to employ about 50 students yes. or not even employ, give internship opportunities for let's say 50 students oh. every academic year at least his criticism would have been taken would have been taken his, his it's good it. that you made that correction because to employ 50 people who are not readily employable i mean businesses are in business to make profit to make profit so he probably will be making huge losses if he took that risk because yeah. it's a training because school. i can tell you for a fact that me as i sit here i was not employable when i got out of KNUSD. i wasn't so Which these is a are fact. things. It means that senior's outburst fact. must be a point where we can start an academic discussion, a back and forth, oh, engage we can review ourselves this thing, and review you know, in a and way. look at the steps forward. He did not only criticize the academic content, he also looked at the organization of the homecoming event. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that the homecoming event was organized when students were not in school? That is fine. Strike. Now, how is it then that all these alumni did not attend the events as well. It was sparsely attended. And this is not only towards the seminars, towards the extra activities that were ordered. There were food bazaars, etc. And there was no participation, zero participation. Vendors lost money. Um, I was part of the steering committee that organized this homecoming event. And from a marketing perspective, oh. I will take that as um, a feedback, and we will just say that no, we no, would, no. would improve. You are a guy. <laughs> we will improve the next community. year. You have to tell us. We will what improve really next happened? year. What really happened? Because from what I heard, yeah. the events were being we held one on down. one no. arm of the of the university, whilst other the vendors and were sent somewhere, somewhere else, else altogether. So you know. it defeated the purpose right from the onset. Senor may have said things a bit too harshly. But we need to take and maybe on a different it platform. Out, on a but different he platform. probably may have had one or two. Tell us what happened. What really well, happened? Did you publicize this thing enough? Because we sit here, and this thing has come out, you know, because Senor has said this. But we didn't know this was happening. No, I didn't go to your university, I didn't know but it was I should have I heard something. The university, the premier university. And I'm an alumnus as <laughs> well. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't, I didn't know about I, it. Yeah. I didn't. Tell us something. Um, so, what really um, happened? You see, universities like Harvard yeah. are what they are because of hey, their alumni. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> You, you get them coming back to the school, mm. giving back to the school. And quite unfortunately, we didn't get the numbers with alumni on this particular were event. Were the year groups involved? They were involved. Mm. I, everyone was involved. We did a lot of publicity. Yeah. I mean, it, it, was, it was even very, very um, encouraging when we got someone like Bolare. Mm. Bolare even coming to sleep 
in his former room that he was that sleeping nice. in. Yes, that is nice. He Talk was so nice. He, he he did so well. So I'll just use this platform to just encourage alumni okay. that next year moving forward, we would want to see you involving yourself in, 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 in activities. these activities. And Great. next year, would also as students or former students want to see a lot more bridging of the gap. Yes. Because if you bridge the gap, then it, it makes it easier for the alumni to think interact and more? interact yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. With the, because with it shouldn't just graduates. be based at the Citadel. Mm. Thank you. Come much. down to us. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> it's been insightful. You are passionate about Legon. So am I. We are both alumni, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. So are you. See, <laughs> we love our school. The odd one out. Yeah. Yes. We will so welcome you and associate but alumni. We would invite you for a short course. Well, I won't mind. <laughs> Viewers, we have been talking to Mr. Chris Atadika, president of the Legon chapter of the Graduate Students Association of Ghana and a member of the steering committee of the recently ended homecoming event towards the 70th anniversary celebrations of the University of Ghana, Legon. Chris, thank you for joining us on Captured by Women. Thank you so much. Welcome back from the break. This has been a rather interesting show. What's your take, ladies? Senior Hossi. <laughs> I know you like that one. Senior Hossi has ruffled the feathers yeah. of our academicians. He made some points. Mm. Albeit, albeit on the wrong forum, mm. at the wrong time, mm. especially because he was an anniversary ambassador and supposed to be mentoring. Mm. And like our resource person said, um, Chris, he should have made constructive criticisms and offered solutions there and then. Mm. That notwithstanding, I think we should engage the discussion further mm. and look at why the public seems to think graduates coming out are lacking employable skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that was interesting for me as well. Mm. And I mm. think the um, development of the Public Procurement Authority um, CEO is also another interesting one Vital. to look at. Um, it puts shameful leadership in public sector to a test. Mm. It also is a test for us to see how the special prosecutor will go through with these investigations and what the outcome will be. Mm. Because there's been a public opinion that anytime someone is cited for any um, in, in Mal, any malpractice, malpractice yes. of any sort. I'm trying to get the word here. Yeah, so it's without quiet, yes. yeah. it you know, sort of goes quiet. And then there's a term that's a clearing house. Mm. Uh, is going to do a job that will make sure that that person comes back mm. or is reposted into mm. another yeah. position. Mm. Um, the coming weeks will be very interesting. Yeah. It should be a test also for us as a country in our fight against corruption. Mm. And um, that would be very good to... Very interesting for us to see. Um, well, today has been another interesting session on Captured by Women. This program, again, is sponsored by Woudin, Le Creator, Emerald Suites here in Cantonments in Accra. Also, a big shout out to Rider One Couture G8 for our beautiful clothes. And uh, we'll see you next week again on another edition of Captured by Women. <laughs>